The Mariner's Mirror podcast is the world's number one podcast dedicated to all of maritime and naval history. We bring you the most exciting maritime projects worldwide, with one foot in the present and one in the past. From the age of timber and canvas and tall ships, to one in which ships were made of iron and steel and were powered by engines. The Mariner's Mirror podcast brings you right up to the present day and will change the way that you think about the maritime past forever. Hello everyone and welcome to the Mariner's Mirror podcast, the first episode of 2022. And let me say right now, thank you all so much for your support and help over the past year. It's lovely to have our first year, our maiden voyage, safely entered into the logbooks. And we are well on the way to becoming a significant mainstay in the rigging of the great ship of global maritime heritage. I'd best stop there or my metaphors will become terribly mixed. We thought we'd start 2022 with a bang, or perhaps a crash, or a thud, or a grinding sound. In fact, that makes me think about the importance of recreating soundscapes of the past. How, for example, can we find out what a steel ship hitting an iceberg at 10 metres per second actually sounded like to those on board? Take the Titanic as an example. Was that sound different according to where you were on the ship? Did the third class passengers in the bow experience the noise differently to those in the first class accommodation high up above the water line? Or those with families who were in the stern protected from the initial shock? Aha, there is excellent research to be done here. The cultural soundscape of the wreck of the Titanic. I can only hope that someone out there is inspired to find out some answers. For those of you, however, who are here for entertainment and education rather than research inspiration, then let's take a look at the history of the Titanic. Yes, it's 2022, so we're gearing up for the 110th anniversary of the Titanic disaster. Now, to help you envisage and understand the ship in new ways, we've done a great deal of work, and this audio episode is designed to sit alongside a fabulous new video we have made and posted on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. What we have done is animated a 3D model of the Titanic made from the ship's original line drawings and plans, allowing us to fly over, round and under the ship to give you an unprecedented new perspective of this extraordinary vessel. I should add here that this is the second time we've attempted such an innovative video. And if you enjoy it, do please make sure you check out the video we made of the Shokaku, the Japanese aircraft carrier involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor during the Second World War. Uh, That video is also, frankly, astonishing. But back to the Titanic. In this episode, I speak with Don Lynch, a historian and member of the Titanic Historical Society, the original and largest Titanic society in the world. Now, we always like to bring you the best of the best in terms of our guests to interview. And in this instance, there really is no one finer than Don, because he has spoken to more survivors of the Titanic than anyone else alive an astonishing 20, as well as numerous relatives of survivors and victims. Don's been researching the Titanic since he was at high school, and in the five decades since then, he's travelled to museums and archives throughout the United States, Canada, England and Ireland to conduct his research. For many years, he has been the official historian for the Titanic Historical Society. In 1992, Don wrote the text for the book Titanic, an illustrated history, which went on to spend 12 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Director James Cameron hired Don as the historian for his movie Titanic, and in the summer of 2001, hired Don as a consultant to his Ghosts of the Abyss project, where they dived down to the Titanic in a Russian submersible to film the wreck for his 3D large format documentary. Don wrote the text for the companion book Ghosts of the Abyss and most recently was a contributor for the James Cameron book Exploring the Deep, the Titanic Expeditions. I discussed with Don a number of issues including the concept of women and children first and how that actually worked in practice and unresolved historical issues relating to the history of the Titanic. 
Before we begin, however, let me just fill you in a little on the history of the ship. I know there are so many young listeners out there who may not be familiar with the story. So here are some of my favourite facts that really bring this remarkable event and vessel to life. In April 1912, the Titanic, the largest man-made movable object on Earth, split in half in the middle of the North Atlantic in 12,500 feet of icy water. That's nearly two and a half miles deep. No one had ever before tried to build a ship as big as the Titanic, so her construction revolutionised the shipbuilding industry. Her hull was made of over 2,000 steel plates, held onto the frames by over 3 million iron and steel rivets. In 1912, there was no electronic navigation or positioning or collision avoidance systems. Judgment of course and speed was all done by eye. The Titanic's 20 lifeboats were carried on the uppermost deck, but 32 more featured in the original design were never put in place to create space for the wealthy to exercise. This meant that the Titanic only had sufficient lifeboats for 33% of her passengers. After she struck the iceberg, water poured in at 7 tonnes per second, 15 times faster than it could be pumped out. When she snapped in half and sank, the stern was travelling so fast that it buried itself 15 metres below the seabed. 1,534 people died. But perhaps my favourite fact of all, and the one that is most often overlooked, is the fact that the Titanic hit an iceberg. Ever since the Titanic sank, the International Ice Patrol has monitored icebergs that drift down the Labrador coast from western Greenland, and in an average year there are 500. But in 1999, for the first time in 85 years, the Grand Banks shipping lanes southeast of Newfoundland were completely free of icebergs. Indeed, since the 1980s, winter temperatures to the north of the Grand Banks have risen by 0.5 degrees, and that's enough to change forever the landscape in which the Titanic sank. Now here's the excellent Don Lynch to tell you more. I hope you enjoy listening to Don as much as I enjoyed talking with him. Here he is. Don, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Oh, Sam, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So tell me about the Titanic Historical Society. It looks, it looks a very impressive, impressive setup. Well, it was formed in 1963 um, after a survivor who turned out to be a fraud um, passed away and everything of his was thrown in the trash by his landlady. And so several people got together, including Ed Commuta of Indian Orchard, Massachusetts, and decided they needed to have a historical society to preserve these things. And so that was 1963. And it has a small museum. It has a number of artifacts, which it's currently leasing to uh, attractions in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, in Branson, Missouri. And it publishes a magazine every quarter, The Commutator. And it's been around for well over 50 years now. Amazing. Very impressive. So the the artifacts that you have in your in your little museum, how how easy or difficult have they been to acquire? Well, they were easy in the beginning. Um, Some of the ones that are particularly interesting are like the discharge book by Frederick Fleet, the man who saw the iceberg, the lookout. And he just sent it to Ed because back then nobody cared as much. And one of the stewards had a piece of carpeting he had taken from the Titanic when he toured the ship while it was being fitted out. And he just sent that to Ed. He'd stuffed a piano stool with it. And when he was scaling down and moving to a smaller place with his wife, he remembered that the piano stool had this carpeting in it and, you know, took it open and sent a piece to Ed. And uh, different survivors just sent different things that they had in their collections. And so, um, you know, menus, things like that. And really um, one family who had been the descendants of one of the doctors on the Carpathia, they sent the life jacket Mrs. Astor had worn. And they'd kept it for that very reason that it came off of her. And then they sent it to the Titanic Historical Society. Amazing. What color was that piece of carpet? It's green. Yeah, very. Oh, I, I was going to go red. I was going to go kind of like blood red is what I suspect. No, it was sort of a dark green, forest green. Um, and it was from one of the staterooms, I think he said. Yeah. 
What do we know? I mean, I, I just let's go down the rabbit hole. What What do we know about the carpets on the Titanic? Has anyone uh, actually looked into well, it? Um, well, one lady told me that they were very thick and she felt like they slowed you when you walked. Um, but um, Axminster, which I think was a common carpet back then, and really it isn't very thick, you know, not by today's standards at all. But back then, people weren't used to pile carpets, you know, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, there's been some debate whether there was carpeting in the dining saloon or not, because one reporter remembered carpeting being there. Um, but the Olympic, the sister ship, never had carpet. And we did find a letter um, written by one of the crew members who he mailed from the ship before the ship sailed. And he told his family, all I'm doing is scrubbing the floors in the dining room. And so that told us it probably didn't have carpet at all. Yeah, I wonder if they were floorboards or, or tiles, because well, the dining room was particularly magnificent. Yeah, right? and, but they used linoleum um, for the tiles, what t we would call linoleum today um, for the tiles in the dining room they, and other rooms as well. A lot of the rooms did have you know, tile flooring um, in a particular pattern, and they found those tiles on the bottom of the ocean when they were exploring the wreck. Amazing. Um, I live in Devon in the southwest of the UK, oh, yeah. and, and it's quite close to somewhere called Axminster. Oh, <laughs> so oh great. I, okay. I want to find out if that's where they made the carpets. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, Edwin, not Edwin, um, Milvina Dean, the last survivor, she had relatives in Devon on her father's side. And she used to visit there fairly regularly. Yeah. What's your favorite of the artifacts that you guys have? Um, that that the society has. Um, yeah, the, the society has, and then, and then more generally. Um, boy, I, I'd have to think about it. I, you know, they're all interesting. I, I guess. Well, my favorite, I guess, is a letter that um, Edwina Trout mailed from the ship, because I knew Edwina Trout very well, and she's the lady who told me that the carpet slowed you when you walked. And so wow. the fact that they have the letter that she mailed to her niece from the ship, I think, is impressive. That's my favorite artifact, I think, that they have. And also, yeah, with a personal connection. So you, you've clearly spoken to at least one oh, yeah, survivor I, of the Titanic. Uh, about 20 passengers, I think. I, every so often somebody asks me, and I, I should keep a list because then I have to sit down and start counting names and, you know, where and when I met them, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I probably interviewed... And I probably met, I think, 20 passengers. And then there were a couple others I spoke with on the phone, but never actually met. Did you ever transcribe those interviews? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't record them at the time and just um, took notes and would jot things down later. That's kind of how Walter Lord did it when he did his book. He, he tended to not intimidate people by putting a recording device in front of them. He would just take notes and then write it all up later. Yeah, it's often how people, I mean, you and I are now talking and recording, yes. very obviously, but it's often how people, um, I've done quite a lot of oral history, and you can have a lovely chat with someone, and they're all free and open, and then you put a little, a nasty looking microphone in front of them, and they say nothing. Oh, they stop, and there's one interview um, with one of the survivors from the 1970s, and you hear, she sees it, obviously, and he drops her voice and whispers, can it hear me? And so, you know, she's intimidated by it. And so you, you just you're better off. You know, some survivors didn't care. You know, they just ignored it. They went on talking. They were fine. And, you know, and I do have a few recordings of some of those. But for the most part, I don't have recordings of when I would actually sit down with the people and talk with them. Did you have a kind of, you know, visceral, physical feeling when you first met a survivor of the Titanic? Did it give you a shiver down your spine? Uh, no, not that I remember. I remember being, you know, exciting, of course. You know, this person was actually there. But, you know, when you're in their presence, they're just, you know, nice, normal people. And, you know, they don't, you know, come across, you know, like in their home or wherever, and they don't come across as particularly spectacular. I think um, I was a little starstruck when I met my first first class passenger, um, Mrs. John Pillsbury Snyder, because, you know, she was on her honeymoon. She traveled first class, which is mostly what we read about. And, you know, coming from the Pillsbury, you know, fortune and everything, I, I was a little intimidated by that. But then she's one I spoke with on the phone later. And she was very, very sweet, very nice, you know, very open about what she could remember. So very, very lovely lady. Yeah. And what's your favorite artifact of the Titanic full stop, not just the ones in your museum, anything well, that's been recovered? Well, of the things that have been recovered, because I've basically been against salvage. I, I think everything is more interesting if you see the video of where it landed. And I think it tells a greater story of where it landed. And, you know, things are obviously fascinating, but um, they brought up a bunch of jewelry in a bag, which I believe was probably being, you know, cabins being looted. 
And there was one little pendant that had a solitary diamond and around it was etched, this be your lucky star. And to me, that is, it tells a story just by its simplicity. And clearly it was not somebody's lucky star. And so <laughs> I, I just think that one item sort of tells a story more than most. Yeah, it's 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 a gorgeous story that it, that, that one uh, among any others was was discovered. Exactly. Uh, so yes. Yeah, it's lucky in itself, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, it, it was its own <laughs> luck, but not for the person owning yeah. it, probably. <laughs> no, it, it couldn't pass it on to its owner, yeah. unfortunately. Um, I'd like to particularly um, talk about the, the kind of the question of chivalry on the Titanic and women and children first, and how that actually worked in practice. What do you know about that? Well, um, basically. You know, the captain gave the order to, to put women and children into the lifeboats. And on the starboard side, under First Officer Murdoch, he put women and children in, but then allowed men in if there was still room. And on the port side, Second Officer Lightoller uh, really took it more to heart and, you know, put only women and children into the boats. And so a lot of those first boats went away practically empty. And I, I say practically, you know, less than half full. And there probably were men who would have gotten in on the port side if they could have. And even on the starboard side, there were men who stood back, which was really interesting because they were allowed in and they didn't go. And one lady said, you know, she got in and she just assumed her husband was following her, but he was sort of helping ladies in and that he didn't enter the boat. And this is, I think, boat five. So it was like the second boat launched and there was plenty of room. And she just said he just wasn't there. You know, and so he didn't get in. And so it was sort of a, I, in, in spite of the captain's order, it was almost sort of an understood thing by passengers that it was, you know, the women and children in the boats and the men would be cared for later, whatever. And so um, it, it also, it's just a, you know, a time it's harder to understand today, especially in, you know, recent shipwrecks like the Costa Concordia, where you kind of had to elbow your way through people. And again, this one lady, Edwina Trout, uh, who I knew, she said in 1912 in an interview that she thought it was disgraceful that single women could get into a boat, a single woman like her, but married men could not. And married men had wives and children dependent upon them for their welfare, for their income, because you know women didn't work. They certainly didn't make as much as men back then. And so... You know, she thought it was wicked, is how she put it, that she could have a place in a lifeboat, but a married man could not. And she actually wasn't even going to get into a lifeboat and then got down to the last one. And there was someone there with a baby and it was a man. And he said, you know, I can't be saved, but we'll take this baby. And she felt lifeboats weren't any safer than ships, you know, at sea, that it was one or the other. You're going to die one way or the other. But she knew there was no hope that the baby would survive unless it got into a lifeboat. And so she took it with her. But other than that, she would have just stayed on board. She didn't think the ship would. She basically, she said, when a ship sank, you died. She grew up in the era when that happened. You know, it was before wireless and everything. And so in her mind, ship sinking, we're all going to die. But she did take the baby, got into the last lifeboat, and then she lived 73 more years. But she just thought it was terrible that these married men couldn't get into a boat with their wives and children, but she could. Yeah. And there are definite stories of women refusing to leave their husbands. Oh, yes. Um, yes. And, you know, sort of an empowerment in that way. And, and it seems to be a, kind of a peculiarly British obsession about how you behave yeah. in a shipwreck. And, and the, the British press were, were often very happy interpreting it in racist terms. So, <laughs> um, you know, the Chinese or if you were African, terrible in the shipwreck and particularly the Italians, awful, <laughs> awful in a shipwreck. Well, and, um, and it was like a judge of national character. <laughs> it, it, it sort of was in a way. The irony is there were almost no Italians on board. Uh, people thought the Middle Easterners were Italians. They all, you know, maybe it was because they had more of the olive complexion or whatever. And there were a lot of people people from the Middle East. And yet, you know, there were comments about the Italians after the Titanic went down and there were almost no Italians because if you were from Italy and you're going to sail to America, you would just sail out of Genoa. You wouldn't go all the way to England to sail for America. And why add that extra leg? And so, but the, you know, everybody, of course, focuses on Mr. and Mrs. Strauss, uh, the elderly couple. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, the co-owner of Macy's department store and he wouldn't get into a boat because they weren't letting men in. And his wife started to get in, stepped out and said, we've been together too many years. I can't go. Where you go, I go. And she stayed with him. 
And so even though there were other couples who did stay together where the wife refused to leave her husband, everybody focused on that one. But of course, in their mind, they were in their 60s. They were elderly at that time. It would be considered so much today. And to me, it's it's in some ways, it's very brave. It's very romantic. But I don't think it's any more brave or more romantic than a young couple who would do it. And there were certain there was a newlywed couple from Cornwall and she just refused. She just refused to leave her husband. He had been in America for several years. They'd been apart for quite a while. He came back, married her. They were taking the Titanic to America and she just refused to go. She wouldn't leave with it without him. Is there a, a kind of a class issue here as well? So it wasn't just women and children first. It was it was perhaps white first class women and children first. Well, the, most of the boats were in the first class area. And so first class did have a leg up in that regard. But overall, it was, you know, women and children. I think people exaggerate and and they, you know, in some ways they exaggerate the color difference. There was only um, one black man and his two children who were black on the Titanic. His wife was white. And, and so when you think about it, the two children survived just fine. And so technically, literally, if you were black, you had a, you know, two out of three chance of surviving. If you look at the overall numbers, uh, which was greater than anybody else on board, you know, than the average overall. But the reality was his children were little girls. You know, they were children. So, of course, they would get into a boat if they could. And he apparently made no effort to try to leave the ship. But his wife and his children escaped. And so it was just a question of getting up on deck. If you could get up on deck, you were probably going to get into a lifeboat if you were willing to go. And if you got up in time and a lot of the third class were sort of held back, they weren't locked below. They didn't have the the gates that always are pictured in the movies necessarily. And you could always get out onto the aft well deck. You could be out in the open and people would come up, you know, the ladders and the staircases from the end. But they did have men posted there and trying to keep the men from coming up. And so a lot of times the women wouldn't leave that area without their husbands. And because, you know, they would be separated there. But then later they would let some of the men up. And so third class had a little bit harder of a time uh, because they didn't have any lifeboats in their own area. A lot of them didn't speak English. They didn't know what was going on. Um, there was one case, a man on deck who swam away said after the boats were gone, this woman came up on deck and she had taken the time to pack. She didn't realize how serious it was. And so she didn't, you know, want to, you know, end up leaving the ship and then, you know, not have her things packed and ready to go if they had to come back for them or something. She took the time to pack and she missed out completely on getting into a lifeboat. Mm, wow. I think maybe our listeners might be quite surprised at the level of detail in the knowledge we have of, of what happened on the Titanic, because most shipwrecks, we don't yeah. really know about what happened at all. It's really difficult to find out. Could you explain to our listeners how and why we know so much about about the events? Well, we we study, you know, the, the thing with the Titanic is, you know, we were fortunate. There were two inquiries at the time, one in England, one in the United States. And so a lot of testimony was taken right up front and they were made public. Uh, for example, with the Andrea Doria, um, they had more of a lawsuit and they settled out of court. And so that sort of testimony never really came out. And so um, we're fortunate that we have those um, people have collected. Uh, one friend of mine, George Behe, has published collections of letters that survivors wrote, mailed from the ship, but also what they wrote afterwards. And of course, the best accounts are the ones written immediately afterwards. They tend to have more detail. And then we were fortunate that, you know, as the years went by, starting in the 1950s with Walter Lord's book, when people got interested in the Titanic again, there were still a lot of survivors left. And so there were some interviews then, some good, some so-so. And so, you know, we've been able to document quite a lot about the Titanic, but there still gets to be a lot of misinformation out there. And I, I always say, go to the primary sources. You know, if you see um, like a YouTube video, don't always trust it, you know, and people see documentaries that are often done just for ratings. And so, you know, people like to get their book published. So they'll come up with a theory that's just totally false. And you really have to go back to the original primary sources. And we do have a lot of information from those that spells out a lot. There's still a lot in question here and there are things that people still debate. But, you know, it's it's out there. It can be studied. You know, if you look at the different accounts and you piece them together, things do fall into place.
Yeah, and I should emphasise that. I mean, if you're listening and you're interested in in it, the um, the inquiries are astonishing, and they are they are so so detailed. And and what's reassuring about that is that as a historian, we're constant. We're going to be continually learning more and more about the story as long as historians come up with a with a, a a new and innovative way to question the sources to think about what happened and that's how we're going to carry on retelling the story um you mentioned um you know sort of controversies and um I, I'm, I'm interested in the we, we've talked about what we do know but what about the unresolved questions what what, what about the, the the you know the questions we don't know the answer to yet have you got any examples of those uh, well I'm trying to think of some off the top of my I'm, you know of course you know the minute we stop talking I'll think of eight but um, you know the, well there there are the controversies about you know if a man dressed as a woman and if so who and one of the officers said when he oh, what, to, to get oh, on to get into boat. a lifeboat yeah one of the officers said that he actually saw a woman in skirts when he was emptying his boat out, fifth officer low, so that he could go back for swimmers. And I don't know that we have other people who authoritatively said that, but we do have several passengers who admitted that they hid in boats. And I think one even said he like pulled a raincoat up over his head. So people thought he would look like a woman or something. You know, we have a few people like that. And so, you know, we're just, you know, it isn't confirmed, I guess you could say. You know, I, I believe that the fifth officer was correct when he said he saw a man in skirts, but who it was, we don't really know. And we could just guess as to that. And and we guess about, you know, oh, the, the big one, of course, is the suicide, you know, of an officer. Um, Tell me about that. Well, a lot of people in 1912 said there was an officer who committed suicide. And um, it, it's a little hard with the officers because there was an adjustment in the ranks right before the ship sailed. Captain Smith brought in a new chief officer. The chief officer was bumped down to first. The first was bumped down to second. And the original second officer left the ship. And so if you weren't aware of that as a crew member, you know, when people are reading the testimony, they said, well, the chief officer said this. And you think, well, do they mean Chief Officer Wilde? Or do they mean Murdoch, who had been the chief officer right up until sailing? And so there's a little bit of confusion, but a lot of people claimed that one of the officers committed suicide. And then, of course, there's been a lot of discussion because people don't want to believe it. Um, you know, it, it is horrific. And James Cameron put it in his movie that the first officer did and got a lot of grief about it. And, you know, all I could say, I was the historian for the film, and all I could tell people was, well, I can't prove it didn't happen. You know, I yeah. and now and at the time, I, I was one of those people like to think it didn't. But um, there are just so many accounts by people who claim that it happened. And usually you can tell with the accounts if they started on the rescue ship, on the Carpathia, before it got to New York. Because once it got to New York, it usually was journalists just going wild, you know, and the yellow journalism of the time. But, you know, if people heard it on the Carpathia from others, whatever, there's a greater likelihood of it. And it seems possible, you know, but, but why you have to wonder, because suicide was such a, it wasn't considered... It, you know, it was basically considered a sin to commit suicide, and it was scandalous if someone committed suicide. It wasn't considered, um, you know, today we look at it as, a, you know, a, in some ways a mental illness, but we're more tolerant of mental illness. We're more aware of, you know, and, um, and educated about mental illness today, depression, things like that. And, you know, as a friend of mine once said, well, why would anybody commit suicide? All they had to do was wait 10 minutes. But, you know, maybe the if it was one of the officers, the overwhelming weight and Murdoch, particularly, who was the officer on the bridge at the time of the collision in charge of the ship. And it might have been this overwhelming guilt. You know, who knows? We just can't say what goes through someone's head. So there may very well have been a suicide among the officers. I can't prove that it did happen, but I won't say that it didn't. And, you know, we just I, I don't think it was Captain Smith. You know, I think it was probably First Officer Murdoch if it did indeed happen. It was interesting just talking about, um, you know, the sh shame associated with suicide at the time and how it was considered by the, you know those with religious convictions anyway, as I said, yes. um, and how that contrasts with this whole tradition of a captain going down with his ship, exactly. which is effectively committing suicide. Yeah, it, and true it is. And, and there's a, a, a wonderful story, you know, it's very brave, where there are these two ladies who were at one of the last boats, 
And um, the younger one turns to the older one and says, you go first, you have children at home. And she gets in. And then apparently the younger lady was, she had trouble getting into the boat. She got caught on the railing or whatever. Um, it's some debate as to which boat it was. And she finally said, I'll get in the next one. And she walked away. And uh, one of the survivors, um, uh, Colonel Gracie, he insisted that it was the very last boat where this happened and that basically she was sort of giving up. And her friends were very upset because that implied that she was committing suicide by not getting into a lifeboat. And so they were very, very upset by that. Although, realistically, you didn't know if you got into the lifeboat that you were going to survive. You know, today we have 2020 hindsight. We know that if you got into a lifeboat, you survived. They didn't know that that was going to be true. None, nobody knew that. And so, you know, but that was frowned upon by her friends. They were um, upset with this man for saying that that happened at the very last lifeboat, because when Miss Evans just walked away, it implied suicide. And that upset the, the, her friends very much. Do we know how many people survived who weren't in the lifeboats? Well, um, I roughly, um, there were... When the ship went down, um, several lifeboats went back. One pulled eight people out of the water. A couple of them died. Um, one pulled three or four out of the water, and one of them died. And then there were two lifeboats they didn't have time to launch. And one of them ended up with about 20 people who survived the night, and the other one ended up with about 12. It had a lot more when it started, but that boat um, was right side up. It was swamped, and it was just too hard on people to stand, you know, waist deep in water, you know, freezing water all night. And so by morning, it only had about 12 people. But the one that was floated off overturned held about 20 because they were able to get up out of the water. And so they had a greater chance of surviving the cold. What do we know about the um, the cause of the sinking itself? I, I read somewhere recently about, you know, the belief now is that there were lots of small hot rips and tears in the hull rather than one one large hole, for example. Yeah. Well, they, they knew in 1912 the size of the hole or the size of the damage, I guess you could say, because uh, one of the naval engineers, the shipping engineers from the shipbuilders, Harlan Wolf, had testified that they figured it was about a 12 foot square area of damage, which is really just the size of a really large door. And so they knew it wasn't one long tear unless it was one very, very thin tear because, you know, they also said, you know, authors over the years would say 300 feet, which was really more than a third of the ship. But if you measure the area of damage that the crewmen in the boiler rooms said it was, it was really between 200 and 220 feet, um, the length of it. But whether it was just some small tears or not, it probably was more that. Although in the boiler room that was completely flooded, it did the people in there said it looked like the whole wall had just given away. And so that may have been where the most of the damage was. But there clearly was damage forward of that because every compartment um, in the first uh, five had damage, you know, just some damage, flooding, absolutely. And but as far as, you know, the amount of damage in each one, if there was just a small tear here and, a, you know, tearing off of rivets there, whereas a larger hole here, uh, we may never know because, you know, when the ship slammed into the bottom of the ocean, we don't know if we were ever to dig it out, have the technology to dig it out, look at the damage, how much of the damage was from the iceberg and how much of it was from the ship hitting the bottom of the, the floor of the ocean. Um, it's, it's fascinating. And also the, how, how they... In in the aftermath, the investigations they worked out the, you know, the speed of the ingress of water. You know, very very knowledgeable, skilled marine engineers. They had a very very clear idea early on of what exactly happened, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. They were engineers. They were well trained, well educated, and you know, by today's standards, where you know you design a ship using you know you know computer graphics and everything, you know, some of it was a little hit and miss. Um, I I always point to the Lusitania as an example, whereas after her trials, they had to send her back to the shipbuilders and put in a lot of steel bulkheads in public rooms just because of the vibration. But at least with the Titanic and her sister ships, that wasn't the case. You know, she was fine. So they, you know, they did add a few columns to the Titanic and the foyer area where, you know, they more than the Olympic the year before. So there really wasn't a lot, you know, that had gone wrong, I guess, with the Olympic. But basically, they were knowledgeable engineers. They knew what they were doing. They had, you know, hundreds of years of shipbuilding behind them to reach this point. Yeah. And what about you? Where, where does your interest lie? 
Well, I to... There are so many different <laughs> things to, to, to investigate. The people, the ship, the design, the fittings, the, you know, I'm, I'm, the trial. Yeah, well, I'm into the people stories uh, because, of course, without survivors, we wouldn't know what happened at all. Uh, but I really um, I, I like reading about, you know, who the people were, where they were from. And then, of course, what happened to them during the sinking and what they went through, what went through their minds, if we know that. And um, just their lives, you know, that because the, the Titanic, just for its one voyage, since it only had one voyage, it is a, a little frozen piece of time, you know, and always will be, you know, with other shipwrecks where you had, you know, multiple voyages before the actual wreck, you could sort of base what happened in the final voyage on things that happened in previous ones. But with the Titanic, it's a very finite story. And I, I like that. And I, I, I'm very much into the people stories. I mean, I obviously appreciate the mechanics of the sinking and all the things that went on and obviously, you know, the design of the ship, everything else. But I really do prefer the people stories, the human interest side of it. Hmm. I've always been fascinated in the experience of people in the sea after a shipwreck. It's a very kind of focused, focused thing. And I remember reading, um, reading about uh, the fear of being in the water with a ship sinking next to you because of um, everything firing up to the surface, almost like torpedoes around you bursting out of the bursting out of the sea, and the danger of breaking your legs by by having you know luggage yeah, firing yeah, yeah. Up from uh -huh. so deep down, um, and and also you know sea life uh, it, it it was le less less relevant with the Titanic because it was so cold. How, how long did people last that actually were unlucky enough to get in the water? Well, I think the longest was about 45 minutes, but usually within, wow. I know, and of course time kind of hangs, you know, it seems longer even to the people listening to the screaming or whatever, but I would imagine in the first five or 10 minutes, the bulk of the people were gone. And the one lifeboat that did go back that made the real effort to go back, um, one of the ladies in it said, you know, because it was so dark, all they could do was pick out a scream in the night and try to follow the sound. And she said, and then it would die out before they'd get there. And then just said, pick another one and go for that. And they only pulled either, it would be different to count, so either three or four people out of the water. And one of them died. He had been injured in some way as the ship went down because they said he was bleeding from his nose and mouth. And so they pulled him into the boat and then he died. But the others, they were able to save three others. And, but she said it was so dark and all you could do was just follow the sounds and the people kept dying before they could get to them. Hmm. And there's the, the, the soundscape, if that's even a word, uh, of, of the Titanic sinking is fascinating. So you've got people screaming, obviously there would have been shout, shouts for help. But the, the, the immense noise that that ship would have made when it tore in half and sunk into the water is, um, you know, a, a, yes. indescribable. Yeah, I I just the, the roaring of it, the, everything falling, yeah, the people groaning, screaming, the, the metal tearing, all of those things happening. And, you know, people that another, you know, rumor was that the boilers came rolling through the ship while well, the ship wasn't hollow. You know, the boilers weren't loose. They weren't <laughs> rolling around like in the high sea. Boilers don't roll from one side of the ship to the other. So but that, you know, kind of became part of the lore because there was so much noise and people had to attribute it to something and they couldn't just attribute it to everything, <laughs> you know, the, to every piece of furniture that wasn't bolted down sliding. And of course, the sound of the tearing metal you know, as the ship was splitting in two, everything, and just all of the people screaming. And the screams, you know, were really what stuck with people the longest. And the lady I knew, um, Edwina Trout, you know, she lived to be 100, and she said her whole life the screaming was never out of her ears, you know. It, it's amazing if you think about the noise of the ship tearing in half. Um, I always say that if you, if you imagine how, how surprisingly loud it is if you snap a pencil in half... Yeah. OK, it, I mean, for the size of it, it gets a really sharp ping and then a bit bigger, a ruler or something. But then then you imagine everything in the ship snapping in half oh, yeah. in that section where it broke in half. So the floors that everything would yes. have gone pretty much all at once yeah, and a quiet night where there's no other noise out there. You know, there isn't like a train passing by at the same time or anything like that. It's not like, yeah. say, you know, a building is collapsing when yet all the city noise is still going on. And it it is it's it. It can be, you know, I think it was for a lot of people very deafening in a way. And I, I had a thought in my head when you were speaking, and I can't think of it now about the, the kind of noises or whatever. But um, just, you know, that I think you just you probably always have that because it's something you don't expect. You know, no one 
you don't expect the noise the ship is going to make. Oh, and what I was going to say is uh, Walter Lord, who wrote the book A Night to Remember, um, he went down after the sinking of the Andrea Doria and watched the Ile de France arrive. And he said he didn't realize how filthy a shipwreck is because it had oil all down the side. Things, you know, when they had hoisted up lifeboats or whatever, that, you know, they had been oil on the water to help keep them calm and everything. The water's calm. And he said that the, the ship was just filthy. And he said he never really thought before how filthy a shipwreck can be. And I, I think that's true even with the Titanic. I mean, they, you know, people were all dressed, you know, basically in whatever they could wear when they left the ship and had to live in that for days. And somebody, you know, even wrote afterwards on the Carpathia, the lines for the rooms that had the bathtubs, there was always a line. People were always in line to take a bath on the ship because they didn't have clean clothes to change into. They just wanted to feel clean again. And, you know, it's it, things like that that you don't think about. There's always little things associated with the shipwreck, whether it's the noise, maybe there's certain smells, like in a, when a ship sinks of oil or something that you don't really think about. And things like that, that, you know, you you just don't think about it until later. Yeah, and I, I think that it's actually kind of a timely moment to be talking about it. We're, at, you know, in the middle of September yes. and the 20th anniversary of the Twin Towers going down was just, just a few days ago. And it really struck me the horror on people's faces that were captured in, with cameras, with the buildings collapsing behind them. I think that's probably as close as you can get to understanding the the, the sheer disbelief yes. mixed with, with horror of what was going on at the Titanic. It was the largest man-made moving object on Earth, and it, it split in half yeah. in front of everyone's eyes. Yeah, they weren't expecting that. They really, And some people, I think, until almost the end, still thought the ship would stabilise and stop sinking. And no, I agree. And, and the thing about 9-11, of course, you know, as they, they found afterwards is, you know, of course, all of the dust and everything and the people who had respiratory issues afterwards. And you wonder, you know, obviously there, you know, was insulation and things like that. But you wonder how much when the Titanic broke apart, you know, what sort of dust and such went into the air at that time? Probably not. There, they didn't know the kind of wallboard, you know, that they used in, you know, office buildings. So clearly not as much of a cloud or anything, but obviously coal dust came shooting out of the funnels, things like that. And you just wonder, you know, about people if that affected them later, that they didn't ever make the connection. There's just no telling. Yeah. And more broadly, the effect on the environment because of because of you know everything that would have been been in the water, you know, as you say, the coal dust. I think that's a really fascinating way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly took a lot of you know things, coal and whatever, down to the bottom, and uh, and obviously you know people and whatever they did go down with the ship did literally feed the fishes for a little bit. And yeah, it's you'd think about that. It just you know the the environment that's down there now with the rust and everything is that affecting the sea life around it? Or is it just enhancing the sea life? You know, there's, there's, I, I don't know. You know, I'm not a, you know, microbiologist, yeah. but you just wonder. These are the things people study. You know, it's like, and and people have studied. You know, what, what are the effect of the rusticles? What causes them? That sort of thing, and the, the debate over whether they're chemical or biological. That sort of stuff. It's interesting. I mean, that, that that marine biological question, it has its own history. It is actually a historical question because it would have affected the local marine environment differently. Yes. You know, just after it sank, as it did now. There is there is a history of that, which yeah. I think is fascinating. And a historian could look at yeah, that. And, and they <laughs> not, think, not a you know, they think that's why there's no bones down there is because it's a very low calcium environment. And so whatever organisms were down there suddenly had this feast of bones and, you know, flesh or whatever, and maybe proliferated. And then when it ran out, died out. So there was sort of probably this burst of a certain type of sea life that then had that died away after that. I don't think I've ever heard the phrase feast of bones. Yeah. Before, <laughs> well, <no. laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you won't well, ever well. have to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um I would just finish. I mean I'm I'm interested in in the um in the iceberg. I'm interested in the fact that it hit an iceberg yeah. in that part of the North Atlantic and how the world has changed so much that there aren't very many, if any, icebergs in that part of the North Atlantic. Well, I don't know that there are or are not because it was very unusual to have them that far south that year. That was a real surprise because the ship was on the southern route for that reason. 
um, they, you know, they had a icebergs were seasonal. But the reason you don't hear about icebergs is because of the Titanic disaster. The International Ice Patrol was formed as a result of the sinking of the Titanic. It tracks icebergs, it warns ships, and you know, today ships just almost never hit an iceberg. Today it's inexcusable to hit an iceberg because you, everybody's been warned about them. And I actually had somebody once ask me if there even still were icebergs because you just don't hear about ships hitting them. But that's one of the benefits of the Titanic disaster, one of the benefits that came out as a result. We have the International Ice Patrol. Ships know where all the icebergs are and they're not going to hit them. Don, um, I've absolutely loved talking to oh, you. Great. I'm Thank going you. to come back at some point next year and find out some more <laughs> okay. I think, about the Titanic. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you all so much for listening. Do please take the time to check out all we have done before on the Society for Nautical Research's website at snr.org.uk. And particularly, please take the time to check out the Mariner's Mirror podcast's YouTube channel, where you will see some really quite extraordinary videos presenting the maritime past in entirely new ways. And I'm most fond of the ones using artificial intelligence and digital artistry to bring ships' figureheads to life. But best of all, please join the Society for Nautical Research. Your modest subscription fee helps to support this podcast and preserve our maritime past. Plus, you get a copy of the excellent Mariner's Mirror Journal four times a year, as well as online access to every single edition we have published in over a century. And perhaps best of all, you get to come to our annual dinner on board Nelson's flagship HMS Victory, something you will never, ever forget. You can join at snr.org.uk.